All right. What else do we have this week? Go for it, Ben. Why don't they just... Nice. Oh, wow. That was extra spicy. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spicy meat just. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Actually, I really didn't like that one, Ben. I mean, mm. Don't do it again. Come on, T-Pain. <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do we have? Uh, so, Daniel or Daniel underscore tech guy said, why don't they just build an orbiting gas station for orbital refueling? So the starship doesn't need to wait for 10 refueling rockets from earth at max payload, but just refuel all at once in orbit and then just refuel as the station is needed or refuel the station as needed. Sorry. And it's Danigel tech guy. There's a J. Dan- oh, Danigel. I said Daniel, didn't I? Yeah. Danny Jell. Danny Hed. Danny Hed. He's from Croatia. Don't know how to say that. There you go. Is, um, maybe Danny's jealous. Let's start with Ben. Ben, why don't they just build a normal little gas station for Starship? Because they already have superchargers. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need gas stations, okay? Gas stations are a thing of the past. God. <laughs> uh, well, you still have to get it up there somehow, right? I mean, maybe this makes sense, but that for like building a uh, highway, for better, you know, lack of a better term, but some kind of like. You know, it'd be, it'd be kind of cool, but it, at some point you're spending the fuel up there to get it up like you're already kind of doing it regardless. I don't know. Maybe if there's a cheaper way to send stuff up versus the one that, like, like if you could have a refueling mission that is cheaper to launch than the Mars mission, you know, that with people and all those supplies and stuff. I don't know. Maybe it makes sense, but it seems like there would have to be a significant cost difference in putting those two things in place. What do you think, Joe? Uh, is is that right? Is it ten refuelings to to, to fully load up a starship for Mars? I don't think it's quite ten, but it's it's like six or eight, wow. maybe. Like it, it is a lot of re- to fully fuel one. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess think because there's... fuel's heavy and you got to carry it all the way up there, and the fuel to get it up there and everything. Yep, yep. and you can only carry yeah. at most one hundred and fifty tons. You know, payload capacity to be able to really get into orbit and return it. So, yeah. And I have I a think, different idea, though. Uh, you, what if you could make the fuel in space? Well, of course, that's a huge advantage is in situ that, resource that, utilization. But that to me would make a lot more sense if, like, somehow you could send something up to an asteroid and have it start, you know, creating the fuel, and then mm-hmm. so you didn't have to launch it. Well, that's kind of the idea behind. Uh, the moon gateway right the lunar gateway that's sort of the idea that you could go up there and they can make the the fuel on the moon but i guess still you would have to like launch it off the moon right <laughs> right and actually just to get out to the moon with starship it takes like three or four refueling trips yeah 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 well this is the this is the rocket equation but no mm-hmm. i i i think this is an interesting idea i mean if you could just like have this regular like like starlink launches right now if you could just have regular launches up to a giant gas tank in space and keep that refueled and then when you need it you the star starship can just dock to it and fuel up and go okay so i think tell, tell us why dash our dreams <laughs> So I think there's two things that are are, are problematic here and why it, m- I'm not going to say it wouldn't be done, but it's just not as advantageous as uh, obviously, yeah, if you, if you do this, you're going to have to do it at some point. I get the idea that, you know, for some missions, it might be nice to just be able to do it in one launch. You go up, you dock, you fuel and you take off. You don't, you're not sitting there waiting to refuel and all these other launches. You know, if you're trying to get people off to Mars or do something really important, now you have to rely on like, you know, six to eight launches. That's definitely not ideal right Mm -hmm. but the problem is um is two things one you know if you have just an orbiting gas station it's going to be on a single inclination on a single very specific orbit and it's not always going to be the orbit of your destination and now you have to you know synchronize to that so so either it's got to be some place that you're constantly going say you're going interplanetary from kennedy space center you can have that thing on a 28 degree inclination and they can match up to it every time they're going to Mars. So someday you could have something like that where they stock it up in between launch manifest just when it makes sense just to go up there, launch it up, you know, and it will always be there kind of in that same the normal path you're getting ready to go to Mars. That could be a possibility someday, you know, but that's kind of a long ways from here because we have to get it flying and all that stuff first, you know. 
But the only problem with having fuel just hanging out in orbit for long periods of time is bleed off. So don't mm -hmm. forget fuel, actually, especially, I mean, cryogenic fuel wants to evaporate. It wants to go change phase from a liquid back to a gas. So liquid oxygen boils off, liquid mm -hmm. methane will boil off. Liquid hydrogen very much boils off because you do have to keep it up or keep it cool enough. Um, even in space where there's, you know, space still has a lot of energy from the sun. So things that are facing yeah. the sun take a lot of radiative heat and get heat, uh, you know, heat up a lot. You actually have to reject a lot of heat. That's what those giant radiation panels are. There's the solar panels on the International Space Station that are, you know, face on towards the sun. And then there's there's radiators that are like par completely pointing, you know, so so they don't face the sun. Um and that's just to reject heat because there is still normally like things tend to warm up too much in space as opposed to being, even though there's nothing to, yeah. Um, so really that's the bigger problem is, is boil off is the fact that if you have something parked up there for a long time, by the time you, you know, say it's up there for a couple of weeks, you may have just lost 20% of your fuel or 30, you know, some, some amount of your fuel. I don't know the, the exact numbers and it just takes energy to even keep it compressed or keep it condensed, keep it cool all these things. So it just adds a lot more logistics, but again, maybe someday, maybe, you know, once we're launching constantly, maybe it does make sense to, Oh, you know, we're, this way we can save ourselves the hassle of logistics because it'll, we know there's going to be enough fuel up in this state, you know, station B has, you know, 65,000 tons worth of fuel or whatever, you know, and okay. Yeah. Go ahead and dock up there. We're fine. You're, you're good to go. But I think that'll be a, a ways out, you know, cause then you also have to have the infrastructure of the fuel station too. You know, all that stuff. So um, future right. thinking, I, I think it's possible. But for right now, it's it's a little bit um, a little far out there. Am I am I off, though? Like, is it's how would it save you money at all? Like in the end, mm. doesn't it still cost you the same amount to put a kilogram yep. into space? Yeah, it wouldn't save you any money. So it's just convenience or it's time, more, maybe? I it, guess time. It'd be it'd be more time for the launch that needs to go somewhere. Because you're still having to launch okay. the same amount of rockets to get to the same amount. But now you also have to have had at some point launched the fuel depot itself, you know, which could right. just be like a starship or whatever, you know, at that point, or whatever. But you will have had to do all of that stuff ahead of time. So it's just shifting the schedule so that that's up there waiting for you as opposed to, you know, you going up there and then waiting to be refueled. Yeah. Now, now what about, though, is there a... Um like a curve there of efficiency. So, so let, let's say you're launching 10 satellites. Uh, is it like, Hey, well, we may as well throw on another five because we're, there's already like some overhead cost, like some kind of cost that, you know, there's like a floor to how much it costs to launch a rocket. So is it cheaper then if you have a more full load than a less full load? And it's like, Hey, we're launching for this mission. We don't need to have a full thing of fuel, but since we're already launching, let's just load it up all the way and then dump that other fuel into the fueling station. Like, are there opportunities there to save money? Um, I mean, if you can maximize your payload capacity and still, uh, in this case, do full reusability with Starship, then yes, there's always going to be some kind of cost per kilogram that works out best um, for that. Right. Um, but the other the other end of it, though, is, is um, I mean, yes and no. I don't know. It again it's kind of like the evaporation thing doesn't it kills the whole idea right? yeah but one of the things i've thought about doing is you know if instead of having people on starship that are sitting there waiting to get refueled waiting to get refueled waiting to get refueled launch the starship that's going to mars refuel it kind of like what he's talking about ahead of time and then launch the crew up on a separate starship transfer them over to the fully loaded one. So don't try to refuel that one per se. I mean, I guess it could be tomato, tomato, but just even for safety wise, transferring a, a fuel, you know, could be a hazard, could be dangerous. Um, have it fully fueled, ready to go, waiting in orbit. You go launch up to it and you transfer cargo and crew over and then you go to Mars. So it's kind of like that, but at least it's, yeah. I don't know. Now, can they do the refueling completely autonomously? Yes. Or would a to. person need to be there? Definitely completely autonomous. They remember, they're going butt to butt. They're doing that thing where there's fuel ports down on the engine skirt, kind of near the, you know, the engines, like the bottom of the vehicle. And that's because when it's sitting on the launch pad, it's actually going to receive its fuel up through the super heavy booster. 
So when it's sitting on the launch pad, normally mm-hmm. a rocket has a separate fuel line connecting from like the launch tower and the umbilicals, lo- connecting to the upper stage to fuel up the upper stage and do all the stuff. What SpaceX is doing for Super Heavy, their plan is to stick the, sup- the Starship on top of the Super Heavy booster. It connects the fuel ports in that process. They fuel the upper stage through the booster stage. They launch and then up in orbit. Once they're on orbit, all of a sudden, oh, well, we already have these fuel ports. So now we can just stick two Starships back to back and transfer fuel between them. No problem. Hmm. And it basically works the same way as firing the engines in the sense that like it just pushes the fuel from one into the yep. other right just like a, a eulage engine or an olage i forget how you actually say it <laughs> a yule log engine and <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, um that evaporation thing you were talking about i mean i've heard people saying or asking if that's going to be an issue on a long trip to mars like how do you keep that fuel cryogenically frozen that whole time and not let it yeah let you know radiate away it is a, it is a factor and a consideration yeah. and i don't remember what the percentage is i think it is i I thought I heard something like boil off is like 1% a day. So you just have to factor that in. That might be Hmm. way too much. But then again, you know, 1% does decrease over time. You know, it's not like, you know, it's reverse compound interest, basically. If you're taking a percent away, Uh, you know, it actually gets to the point where 1% is less each day. Yes. In terms of actual volume. Exactly. So maybe it's not a huge deal. You know, on a 90-day trip, it's not like you're going to lose 90%, you know you'll lose, I don't know, 50% or something, but you have to know ahead of time, like how much does it take to land then? You know, <laughs> is that enough to yeah. land? Yeah. So there you go. Hmm. That's kind of the, that's kind of the answer that I, that I can think of. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this clip from our show. If that's just not enough for you and you want to watch the full episode, you can go to olfpod.com YT. And if you want more from us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll get early access to episodes. You can join our awesome community. You can actually watch us record live and get your name in the credits by going to olfpod.com slash Patreon. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Check back every Friday for new clips here and new episodes on the main channel. Thanks, everybody.